It's the time of the week when we welcome back our popular Tuesday trio of MPs from the three major parties. If we play this right, we might get through without any mention of Justin Trudeau. All right, Conservative MP James Rajat, NDP Deputy Leader Megan Leslie, Liberal MP Roger Cousiner. Welcome to you all. Thanks. Just coming to the Johnny, studio on a nice yeah. summery kind of day. Very nice. Yeah. And you have the gag order has been sort of removed. Mm -hmm. The speaker today said, well, you know, there's a lee, there's a there's going to be a list, but if you stand up and make some noise, I might recognize you and you don't have to follow the list. Is this a good compromise for James, do you think? I think he threaded the needle very well, frankly. I think it was a very wise decision in the sense of reaffirmed the fact that members of parliament do have the right to speak. But in, in terms of uh, the proportion of the statements that the parties have worked out, that will remain in place. And so if members feel that they do not have the right to speak, they'll have an opportunity to do so and be recognized by the speaker. But frankly, I think the system works relatively well now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have our, our deputy house leader, Tom Lukiski, uh, manages it for us, and he does an excellent job. And so, okay, as usual, I forgot the call for the clip. So let's hear, let's hear what Andrew <laughs> Andrew Shear had to say in the house, which you just explained. Let's roll that. I will continue to be guided by the lists that are provided to me, and when and if members are competing for the floor, will exercise my authority to recognize members, not in a cavalier or an informed manner, but rather in a balanced way that respects both the will of the house and the rights of individual members. Megan, NDP, you do want to go again? No, no. The speaker spoke very well, well no, on we your behalf. Just... I mean, it seems to me that this gives a person that's really determined to make a statement an option of trying to yeah. get up there and be heard, doesn't it? Yeah. I, when I actually spoke to this uh, point of privilege in the House, and uh, I truthfully didn't know what outcome I wanted. Uh, what I tried to offer was the perspective of how we handle things in the NDP. And the reason I didn't know what I wanted was I actually don't know if I wanted the Speaker to be able to direct uh, how, we're, how we're doing this, because what we're doing on the NDP side anyway is working. So the piece I really liked about the Speaker's decision is when he talked about equality. Right, so he's not there to determine. He he said he's not a referee. He's not there to say you you're in, you you're benched. He is there though to ensure quality. And so, I thought that was a good. Uh, I thought it was a good nuance, mm -hmm. um, and it does create that opportunity for people to say I haven't been treated equally, right? right. And to actually have their their voice heard, but not necessarily say I was supposed to go today. I should be able to go today. Now, you know, not the nitty gritty, but yeah, sort right. of the broad equality piece. Now you're a leader. I'm not going to say his name. Uh, it's he did, still got a motion. He did. <laughs> still got a motion on the floor. Does that go ahead tomorrow, or is it being pulled? Uh, they're as we as we speak. They're uh, discussing that okay. as to what uh, what the next move is going to be. But you know, the speaker had a tough hand to play here. And, did he do uh, it well? Well, I, you know, I thought uh, it made sense with what he was sort kind of, of doing. About I, this, I think a lot of the right? a lot of the issue was back to the. The turmoil within the uh, Conservative caucus mm -hmm. and uh, the the split that's uh, that's occurred there. So, uh, you know, I don't think he was expected to solve that problem. But uh, um, we'll. Uh, we'll I, I think they're assessing it as we uh, as we're but being can interviewed. I just, can I say respectfully, this is still coming back to what we discussed on a panel previously and some some weeks ago. It is an issue with respect to members of Parliament and the relationship with the Speaker and the members of Parliament as whole. Statements is one thing. Uh, question period is another, and speeches are another. And I think we as members of Parliament are going to have to address all three going forward mm -hmm. in terms of how we want Parliament to function, and could it function better if we change some of these, uh, some of these processes? Good point. All, all right. right. Let's move along to the topic of the day, which is this terrorist attack that seemed to have been thwarted. But uh, one thing that was struck me yesterday, John Lapierre was on our show as a strategist, and he said, you know, I think there's a connection here between uh, them accelerating this terrorist bill onto the Monday agenda and the fact that they must have had prior knowledge of these arrests coming down and this operation. It seemed a little over the top of the time, but that, that seems to be some consensus. Let's have a clip. Let's, well, let's roll the clip of that again. Here it is. <laughs> The timing of the arrest is a bit of a mystery, uh, and certainly I would like to hear the RCMP's explanation for that. They've been very clear that there was no risk to public safety, and it's surprising, to say the least, uh, that this arrest would be made now, uh, close on the heels of the events in Boston, and timed perfectly with what was happening in the House of Commons. So he finds it mystifying. Uh, Megan, do you find it mystifying? you think there's a connection between the timing of the terrorist bill and the fact there was an operation underway and arrests uh, affiliated with that? Well, the reality is I th that the minister would know about these kinds of major right. investigations, right? I mean, 
we can't get around that. So um, I, I, I do think that there's something political afoot here. Uh, this is, I think, trying to get a partisan win out of a situation uh, in our communities about our safety, about uh, you know, about our terrorism in our communities, potential terrorism in our communities. So I do think that this is Conservatives playing politics with something that is really, really serious happening in our communities. And I don't think they should be uh, playing those kinds of games. It's a little queasy to have a, an op RCMP operation linked to a political agenda like that. Doesn't that bother you at all? Or do you think that's fair well, game? Well, it bothers me. I, you know, I, I think what Canadians have come to understand that uh, uh, Stephen Harper makes mistakes, but he doesn't do anything by accident. And uh, you know, to, to, to sort of link these two up, I don't. I don't think it's a, a, a huge stretch here. Um, you know, we've, we we uh, we were looking forward to an op day motion on uh, on uh, Monday morning. We were, we had the opposition day that was uh, identified, and we thought that we'd be coming forward uh, with the op opposition day motion uh, on the uh, standing orders. But um, you know, that was sort of changed. Um, you know. Friday afternoon, last minute on Friday afternoon to, to bring... And don't forget, this piece of legislation was brought before the House last spring. Mm -hmm. So the immediacy, uh, you know, uh, I think if you connect the dots, there, there's got to be something there, and I'm sure it'll come out. Any eventually. dots to connect, James? Well, I, I think it's fair to say, and, and my understanding is liberals are supporting this legislation, is this legislation does need to be passed. I mean, obviously, with the situation that happened in Boston, there was an immediacy in terms of ensuring that this legislation is passed, implemented in effect. I think, frankly, we should be very cautious about going down the rabbit hole and saying that there's coordination politically with the RCMP in terms of announcing arrests. I mean, the RCMP are independent. The RCMP will make their decisions the in the best interest. This is, I mean, we have to have faith in them that they are operating independently. They are announcing their decisions when, and taking action when they should be taking action. There's not political direction in terms of that. I, the, I don't think the, anybody's saying that. No. And, and I hope that nobody thinks that that's what I meant. I meant the other direction. I mean, the, the minister would know what... A major case like this, the minister would know that this was happening. It's absolutely the other direction. I would never make a, an assumption about that. And then the it cascades RCMP. back politically. And when you say this no. legislation needs I mean, to be passed, it doesn't. So the content of the I mean, legislation we... is not very good. This is a sunset clause, right? So it's a piece that we've had around and we have to revisit. It's never been used. And the RCMP didn't use this provision in these arrests around uh, the Via Rail potential Maybe attacks. they didn't need them. So, mm -hmm. so it doesn't need mm -hmm. to be passed. These aren't effective but the, measures. But counterterrorism experts have asked that they be brought back. Former ministers, in yes. fact, former liberal ministers have said, yes, these measures, in fact, should be brought back. Yes. I mean, these measures are entirely reasonable. The Supreme Court said, you know, the government had to respond to their concerns with respect in this area, and I think the government has responded very well in this area. I mean, these are very reasonable measures to prevent a terrorist attack from occurring in this country, and we found the right balance in I this bill. I strongly disagree. Okay, well, let's move along to the last topic I wanted to bring up. Uh, Security Intelligence Review Commission is a place oh. that oversees... It's sort of the watchdog for CSIS and other issues of public concerns with uh, security forces. So the, the Prime Minister, as you may know, just appointed uh, Deb Gray. Now, for those of you who want trivia, Deb Gray was the person who hired a young guy named Stephen Harper as her aide back in the late 80s. And now she's on CERC, and then she joins Chuck Strahl, another reform MP. But then keep in mind, Arthur Porter the, was the chair, and he's now kind of a fugitive on the run. Uh, <laughs> I guess the question right. is, is CERC becoming a bit of a patronage place? Even though I don't think it pays very well. Um, and that, is that a concern to you? Actually, I want to go to you, Megan, because your leader raised this yesterday. Mm, yeah, Tom Mulcair actually uh, wrote a letter to the Prime Minister about this. Uh, is it becoming a, a partisan appointment? Yeah, you think? I mean, this is... <laughs> and the Conservatives haven't seemed to, to learn anything from the Arthur Porter uh, issue. I mean, Deborah Gray... A woman who has served her community well, uh, you know, a very well-respected member of parliament. Uh, Chuck with, Straw was too, by the absolutely, way. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But is this what happens? You you step down, then you get these these little partisan uh, treats. It, it it is absolutely partisan, and I don't think that they should be playing politics like Roger? this. Roger, is it the same Deb Gray? I'll never take my uh, parliamentary pension, Deb Gray. Is that is that the same <laughs> one we're talking about? All be, right. You know, because <laughs> you know he's here. She she she's got this. Uh, this appointment now, I think there has to be an investigation into the root causes of this patronage frenzy that's going like on with causes, the Conservatives uh, right now. <laughs> I'm wondering what Preston Manning's thinking. You know, stifling the backbench on, uh, on not being able to speak in the House, and now patronage Good appointments, morning, I'm sure he is convulsing. Uh, with, you know, this is, this is just <laughs> got to be tearing.